recognize everyone. Woo! Excellent. Don't be dropping the microphone. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> they also did special effects. Um, to my to my left, Teller and Tim Jensen, Ken Gillette, and Farley Ziegler. Um, so I'll ask a question too, and then we'll throw it out to everybody. And um, I have no answer for it, but I'll just ask Tim the question: Why? In the big scheme of things, why? Wow. Well, uh, this uh, idea just sort of came to me. Uh, I mean, it's funny how our subconscious mind works, but I've been probably thinking about this problem for some ten years, and how how did Vermeer get the photographic look? I mean, there's no no cameras. And, uh, but it was years later when this idea occurred to me that you could match the colors exactly. So they had theorized that people could trace shapes with a camera obscura. Artists, you know, going back, well, the camera obscura goes back to Egyptian times. But I thought that they could not only sh trace the uh, shapes, but trace the colors. Because Vermeer had that look, and there's certain dead giveaways in Vermeer that there's something funny going on. Um, and so the idea occurred to me in the bathtub, and then, like usually, if I get an idea, I um, write it down, and then I start Googling, and 99 times out of 100, somebody else has already um, done it, and then I can take it off my to do list. Well, um, that didn't happen. I searched, I searched for months. Uh, I started searching in other languages, looking uh, for artist, mirror, comparison, anything I could find in, in all these languages, nothing. So uh, that's when I did the uh, experiment on the kitchen table. And the experiment worked way, way too well. And um, that's when I got this feeling that I was onto something. And um, that's when I mentioned it to uh, Tip Ken. And uh, it sort of set up develops uh, some momentum at that point. Penny said that a movie should be made about it. So, so for Ken and for Tell, you were basically there from almost the beginning when you really decided to start the project. I, I, could, I came in pretty late. I mean, I, uh, I, uh, I came in about five years ago talking to Tim. You know, we were just having a supper. He'd flown out to, to, to hang out with me because I had spent a lot of time working with my children. I hadn't been around adults much. I wanted to see Tim. He's a good friend from a long, long time. And uh, he came out and we were just having supper. And I said, well, talk to me about something that has nothing to do with show business. that will be no work for me at all. And he said, well, what do you know about Vermeer? And uh, he started telling me uh, some of what you saw in the movie. And also showing me, he carries a video camera with him, showing me video, some of which is in the movie. And uh, my mind was blown. You know, I, I didn't know much about Vermeer. At that point, and then I told him, "Just stop what you're doing. This this has to be a movie." And uh, so I've only been uh, you've been really thinking about this seriously since 2000, and uh, I I came on much later than that. And then after about a six months or a year or so of monkeying around, we brought in uh, we brought in Teller and Farley. So uh, we haven't been we haven't been with Tim since the beginning. But once Tim got going. We were the ones that uh, made it so he wouldn't stop. <laughs> I was say, did, the, did the three of you really have to like push it? At one point, you said if you weren't making the film, you would have just stopped. Did, did, were there many points where you had to sort of like push him to keep going and do this little dance? I was a lucky recipient of that gaze of hate <laughs> yeah. because for seven months, uh, Tim and I, uh, I video Skyped him uh, every day for seven months while he was painting. Got it. <laughs> well, but um, I would say there was an obligation. Uh, there were two times that stare of hate hit me. The main one was the one that's in the film uh, when I asked, you know, if you were making a movie, would you quit? And he really, I mean, I don't think it was evident by every appearance that you you you, you can feel that he he would have quit is the answer. And the other time is when. Uh, all of the days that Tim was painting the carpet, the call 
was very brief. <laughs> <laughs> More dots was the answer for everything. All of this. So that was no, I, I don't know, I, don't, I didn't sense you were going to quit then, just that it was hell on earth. Yeah, it was hell. It, but um, back to what Penn said, Penn, um, the point Penn came in, the point we had that meal was when I had tried that first picture of my father-in-law from a photograph. That, is, that was my experiment. And I extrapolated wildly from that that you, you should be able to paint a Vermeer using exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, to me, it was like, okay, I can quit now. I painted the father-in-law, so Vermeer must have used uh, you know, this trick. Um, but, um, you know, then I had this uh, idea that I would make a, something that looks something like a Vermeer. And I, it wasn't all that ambitious at the time, but that was my mindset when Penn and I had dinner, was that I was going to get uh, an old chair, maybe a chandelier, and, and you know, a couple things, and, and set it up. And, uh, and then Penn said, stop, stop everything. And that's when it really, the, the, the nature of the experiment changed radically, because then I felt that it was a real opportunity to to prove, to try to prove the theory in, in a much more complete way, to make it look like a Vermeer. Um, so make it look like an existing Vermeer. And that's when it kind of got crazy. And Teller, uh, who came on early as the director, uh, gave me some pretty simple instructions. He said, cover everything you're doing from as many angles as you can. And so we bought a whole lot of cameras uh, and still cameras and motion picture cameras, um, and just kept them running. And of course, disk storage is so cheap that you can just keep running. And so I would turn the cameras on in the morning and just let them go. And then I forgot about them after a couple of days. I, I was just unaware, uh, you know, that the cameras were there. Um, and uh, I think it was about 2,400 hours of material. <laughs> Had to be boiled down to 80 minutes. And if somebody had to watch all that, it wasn't me, it was Farley and uh, you know, Patrick Sheffield, our editor, that did that. And then Penn and Teller uh, also um, had to uh, see the majority of it. And then they pulled out a thread of a story out of all that material, and it could have gone a lot of different ways. I have no idea how they did it, but um, they did. It's pretty interesting that many, many documentaries uh, either manufacture the event, either they're a stunt, or uh, afterwards they try to piece together uh, footage that other people have shot. Uh, technology, which is one of the themes of the movie, is also part of the form of the movie. Uh, this movie could not have been made, made even ten years ago. Um, would have been too expensive. Uh, uh, so the talking about Vermeer using technology, the actual movie itself is using technology. And I can't think, and I'm sure there are examples, but I, I haven't been able to think of one off the top of my head that is an event like this that is this well documented while it's happening. I mean, we were fortunate uh, to have Tim be so monomaniacal on this and also be such a techie at the same time. I mean. The very odd thing about this movie is that the, in many cases, the uh, the photographer, the cinematographer, in many cases, is Tim, and in many many cases, the technician is Tim. Uh, so you've got this um, this quality of the movie, which is so uh, so personal and so honest about Tim, is not only about Tim, but also Tim is in a certain sense. Doing it, and uh, I believe that's something brand new, and kind of like the movie talks about how uh, uh, the same kind of technology and heart from the 17th century can be done in the 21st century. We also have the same kind of passion and focus and love that Tim has can now be covered in a different way. Uh, I can't think of a, another example where. You uh, you take for granted, you know, we have come to a place in the 21st century where you take for granted that you can have an event that I believe is this important and covered by many times five cameras. Nine. 
No. <laughs> I didn't watch all nine. I had a strange feeling I was being watched. <laughs> Whenever, I was going to say, whenever Tim sat down to paint, he had rigged the room so he could flip a switch and nine cameras were running, a combination of uh, felt cameras and some stills so that, um, what was the coverage just because it's insane and interesting? Uh, well, yeah, there, was, um, uh, there were uh, uh, four, um, four camcorders shooting high def. There was one red one, there was a red epic, and then there were several uh, Canon 5D Mark IIs that were um, controlled by a single computer, so they would shoot time lapse, uh, one frame every 10 seconds, and that would all go into the computer automatically. And then at the end of the day, I would have to do the digital imaging technician work, which is what they, they call the guy that makes sure one of the recordings get lost. And then I had to ship him off to three different geographic locations due to insurance reasons, and uh, you know, it's a lot of work. To that. I mean, it took a couple hours a day just to do the motion picture part of it. And the other thing is that uh, Tim, when Penn said this has to be a movie and Tim went along for the ride, Tim realized that to conduct the experiment uh, for real and impeccably, that every brush stroke uh, had to be documented as opposed to putting up a five minute YouTube video with a Vermeer like uh, room. It, it changed the coverage substantially. And those who are doubtful about uh, uh, what Tim did, they can watch every, every brush stroke that goes onto that canvas, we have covered. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's pretty astonishing. <laughs> that you have, you, have, you, have, you have a painting uh, that, that complex and that took that long, that there's no time that paint goes on that canvas that we don't have motion pictures of. By the way, I did a calculation based on the number of frames that the actual time the paintbrush was on the canvas actively painting was a, a surprisingly uh, small uh, number. It was 220 hours <laughs> of actual painting, but it took yeah. seven months to do that. That tells you a lot about Tim, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> then he counted. Uh, do, we have, do we have mics for uh, people? Great. Let's go to that person in the back there in the middle. And, yeah. He's standing up. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so curious about something that uh, uh, wasn't covered in the film because you went to such lengths to recreate exactly all the same uh, uh, things around making a painting and you wanted to do it in natural light, but San Antonio is not the same latitude as Holland, and also it took over four months, so was there any like thought about the quality of light and like how many hours of natural light and what were the best ones? And yes, and there are scores of things just like that that have been left out of this film because it would have been, you know, a 20 hour film. Um, there, it, there have, people have written about the Dutch light and that that somehow had a uh, importance in, in, the, in the Dutch Golden Age of Art. Um, and of course, Delft is a charming city and it has uh, uh, canals running through it and the light shines off the canals and so on and so forth. So I did uh, go to Holland, I went to all the places where Vermeer probably painted. I took panoramic pictures, high, uh, HDRI pictures, which could record the absolute amount of light uh, all the way around the sky. I ran a computer simulation of the way the sun travels through the sky at various latitudes, compared Delft to San Antonio. I aligned the compass heading of the building that I rented to one that was the same compass heading as the mirrors. I was able to prove that the sun would actually enter those north windows in Vermeer's house, something nobody knew. Uh, but late in the summer, late in the afternoon, the sun comes straight in those windows because they are not facing exactly north, they're north and northwest. Uh, so I compared, um, I have all those HDRI panoramic shots taken throughout Delft, and I also um, did a, um, a time-lapse camera, a fisheye lens, during the entire painting, once every 10 seconds, takes a picture of the sky, my San Antonio sky, uh, with the, uh, all the data as to the, uh, the, the lens settings and the shutter speeds so that you could actually calculate the brightness of the sun. 
I did some very simple experiments, which a sane person would do, of taking a light meter. <laughs> and there is, there is no difference between Dutch light and uh, San Antonio light. As it turns out. But I will just say, you don't fuck with Shady, <laughs> Shady will fucking kill you. <laughs> That's the last question. There we go, that's right there. But down here. Right here. Thank you. Wow. Uh, a question to Tim and a question to Penn and Teller. Tim, did you ever uh, read up on Robert Rauschenberg's EAT program, Experiments in Art and Technology? It was a big program in the late 60s and early 70s where they tried to bring together art and technology. Nope. That's something you might find of interest. I, I, I read a lot about uh, the golden age of Dutch art, and that's my field of expertise, if I have one. And uh, I, I am not an art historian, I'm not an art critic, I'm not an art person, I'm a computer guy that did a weird experiment. So, but uh, if, uh, you, you call it the EAT? It's called, it was called EAT Experiments in Art and Technology. Okay. It's Robert Rauschenberg. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the, and, and Penn and Teller, you know, my mom used to uh, paint by numbers, and she thought of herself as an artist. And I was always embarrassed as a kid to, that she would show off these paintings to my friends. And then I look at this, and I'm not comparing the kind of work that Tim did, but at the core of it, where the person who thinks themselves not as an artist can become an artist through use of technology. It's not the act of creativity, which Vermeer had when he, the composition of the, of the painting, but painting by numbers and what Tim has done in this new age, is there any correlation in your mind? <laughs> You, you're, you're kind of asking a question about magic, uh, and um, and that is, does it matter how it's done? Um, Andy Warhol said, "Art is whatever you can get away with," and uh, I, I think uh, technology is a word we have to divide, define properly. Paint is technology. Brushes are technology. Uh, canvas is technology. Um, I don't think that any use of any technology diminishes uh, art whatsoever. Art is not sports. Art is not Olympics. It's okay if Jimi Hendrix used some drugs to get his finished records. Um, it's okay if you use a projector. It's okay if you use anything. What matters is what's there. Once anyone has decided that one photograph ever taken is art, then we have opened this up completely. We are not judging how well a person moves his, his or her hand on the canvas. We are judging how much that talks to our heart and how much that talks to our truth. And how you do that does not matter. Uh, uh, Tim says this very clearly in the movie where he says, if whatever art there is in his painting is Vermeer's, because the composition, the idea, the way that's put together is all Vermeer. I think, if you, um, uh, I can very easily believe that there is a paint by number painting that would move me and mean something to me. And the fact, how it's done does not really matter to me at all. Um, that gentleman right there. <laughs> now that you've uh, mastered uh, this Vermeer <laughs> form of uh, painting. Uh, are you just going to go on and do something else? You've got a great technique in hand. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, doing it again? We'll have a sequel. Some of them are your work. What do you want to call it? Uh, I am interested in this topic, and I have been for 10 years. I, I don't honestly uh, feel like making a painting again. <laughs> 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 Totally but that could change. I'm not sure, but there's a lot more I'd like to find out about this topic, and I'm doing it now. I'm, I've, I've been researching this for you know, almost a decade, and I'm I'm looking specifically for how this idea, where it started, and how it moved 
through the art world. There's certainly a lot of evidence that other artists knew of this basic idea. Yeah. And, um, and I'd like to find out who invented it and who told who and how it got to the mirror. Yes, thank you. Wait, wait. Wait, wait. Wait, wait. Since one of the tenets of your work is that you were painting exactly what it was that you saw, I wonder about your process uh, in that you first painted the skirt and then painted over it the wheel of gamba and then painted over that the chair. How did that evolve? Did you keep adding elements to the original that you were looking at or what? Yeah, well we know, uh, first of all I read a lot of painting manuals from a lot of periods in history. And there are some good Dutch painting manuals from Vermeer's time, there are some modern painting manuals. Um, and generally speaking, they would paint from back to front, which only makes sense because then the edges just happen, you know, between objects. Um, and uh, so that's the basic rule. Uh, and, and so there's no reason to have everything in the room at one time, and there, there almost never was. Uh, when I first started, the, the room was entirely empty. The mirror was on the wall, and that painting was on the wall, and the rest of the room was empty, and that's what I painted. Just to follow up, in the original painting, has that ever been x-rayed, and is there evidence in that painting that different layers come moving forward existed, or is that something that you have been able to investigate? Yeah, the, the painting has been x-rayed. Um, I can't speak because I don't remember to uh, which uh, you know whether he painted the entire uh, Viola de Gamba, for example. I don't think so. Uh, although there is evidence that um, he painted only part of the harpsichord, uh, that he only painted the part to the left of the girl, and then there is then the girl uh, it was painted, and then there's some more harpsichord to the right. And the harpsichord to the right doesn't match at all the rest of the harpsichord. Different colors of paint, um, very, very, very different uh, patterns. Um, there's a, uh, the lid of the harpsichord has a Latin motto on it. And uh, the Latin motto doesn't come out in the right place if you extend the, the harpsichord across. And the harpsichord is something like 77 inches across, if you measure it, given the scale of the painting. And they didn't make them in that size. They made them about, I think, 66 inches wide. And so he fudged the right-hand side of the heart support. So that's, that's an example of the sort of the piece, piece work that you do. You, you only bring in one thing at a time. For example, my daughter Claire posed um, as the young lady and she was never in the studio at the same time as the older gentleman, which is a darn good thing in my book. Because <laughs> uh, I know that guy. <laughs> and so um, they, they never had to be there. And, and that was one of the uh, big uh, questions in my mind, is how long would they have to sit there? And could a human hold still long enough? I didn't know how fast it would take me to paint. Um, but it turns out it was quite tolerable. Claire had to pose for two days uh, in two sessions that were about two and a half to three hours each. And she had a headrest, which you saw in the picture. And she found it to be strenuous, but not, not uh, impossible. And um, so, so uh, I, found my, I, I found it very stressful to paint my daughter and Graham, the gentleman, because I knew they were suffering up there, and I painted very, very fast. I painted as fast as I could, and some, some of the roughest brushwork on the whole painting. Can I just say, no, that Tim just called it a headrest, but we know it's a head clamp. Enhanced <laughs> 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 uh, interrogation. Um, right here, last question. Yes, here in the front. Do you think from here used a head clamp on it? Uh, actually, there is evidence that they I was wondering if you, um, this is for everyone, if there has been backlash from the art world 
when you go to screen, do you have people show up? Has anybody said anything to you? Have you heard anything? Uh, you're kind of the first people to see it. Okay. Um, so uh, I don't know if there's any backlash in this room. Maybe we'll see it right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's certainly David Hockney when he when he when he wrote the Secret Knowledge and spoke about it a lot in 2000. Was it? Yeah. Um, there was horrible, horrible, unpleasant uh, backlash. Uh, we haven't seen we haven't seen any, and I, I guess I could add to that yet. But we might not. I mean, the, 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 we, we, we tried, well, we, we didn't try anything. Tim is not confrontational. This is not uh, in any way, shape, or form uh, an attack on Vermeer. It's an absolute uh, pure love for Vermeer. So I don't, I don't know if we'll, if we'll see any of that. I think maybe, uh, maybe people will, will, will recognize how pure uh, Tim's heart is. That's... And the Queen? And ah, the, the queen. Um, yeah, maybe you can show your, your paintings of the queen. Maybe it can happen one day. Maybe you can grab it too. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's not talking out of school. Uh, but, um, the, uh, the, the painting is owned by the uh, Royal Collection, which is the Queen of England. She actually takes the paintings to parties sometimes, <laughs> just for fun. I do that too. We had the chance to discuss, uh, have a discussion with the, the surveyor of the Queen's pictures, a man named uh, Desmond Shaw Taylor. And um, we were trying to talk him into scanning the picture for us at high resolution with a scientific scanner. And in the process, I told him about my experiment. I had just completed the picture. And, you know, I didn't know what to expect from this, you know, maybe the most important man in art in England. Uh, but he, he, he started leaning forward. He didn't say anything. And I thought he, he was, like, going to take a nap for a while there. <laughs> and then he said, you did what? <laughs> and he understood everything I told him. He's, he's an expert on optics. He's done a lot of camera obscure experiments himself. He says, where is the painting now? And I says, it's over at the hotel. I said, can we go and see it? And so Desmond and Farley and I went to the hotel, and he, he looked at it, and he stared at it, and he didn't say much. And he, he said, I have some homework to do. <laughs> <laughs> and Tim, you said he was the, um, he understood it the quickest of anyone you'd ever seen. Yeah, he knew exactly what was going on. He knew what was going on. That's unfortunately all we have time for. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.